Hello everyone, welcome to Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff. I am your host, Stephanie. Welcome to the show. Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff is just the show where I put on my makeup while I'm talking about whatever is on my mind. It is not a makeup tutorial, so I'm not going to be explaining everything as I go. But if you stick around, you might see some things that you like and you want to try for yourself. So, this show, um, it really thrives on subscribers and... I've noticed a lot of my viewers are not subscribers, so if you're tuning into my show every week or whenever I happen to make one, please hit that subscribe button. Please like the videos. Please share the videos because the more people we have here, the more fun it is. So today's topic is an interesting one. It's one where I'm going to um, have to choose my words carefully so I don't get dinged by the YouTube gods and have my video hidden, but it's one that I think is going to be a lot of fun. And what we're going to talk about today is dun, 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 the history of the vibrator. This topic, as with so many topics that I cover, is the result of some um, divine intervention, you could say. <laughs> I had been asking my chosen deity, if you will, to um, give me some ideas because I needed one. And then somebody, a friend of mine, tweeted about vibrators and I was like, oh, so that's what you want me to do. Okay. And <laughs> here we are. So the history of vibrators, there are a lot of myths surrounding the history of vibrators. And so what I aim to do today is to separate fact from fiction and really get down to the buzz about vibrators. You see what I did there? That was clever, if I do say so myself. All right, so just to give you an idea of uh, how common the usage of these tools are, as of 2018, a survey showed that 52% of women in the United States have used one and about 20, between 20 and 30% of men have used them. So these aren't uncommon tools. These are wildly popular tools. So then the question becomes, where did they come from? And it's, I was surprised. I thought I knew. And I bet, I'm willing to bet a lot of people think they know and maybe you'll be surprised just as I was. So let's dive into this, okay? So one of the myths surrounding the evolution, I guess, of the vibrator is that Cleopatra herself had a version of one in which she had a gourd that had been emptied out and filled with bees and she would apply the gourd to her genitalia and the buzzing, excuse me, the buzzing of the bees created a sensation similar to that of a vibrator. I, I thought this was true. I thought that was like hilariously clever and I was very disappointed to learn that there is almost no evidence to support that claim. So then again we're left with where did they come from? Now it's worth noting that toys are not a new thing. They have been around for literally thousands of years. You can find, I mean, they've been found in archeological digs. You can look at the art on um, walls in ancient civilizations and you can see depictions of toys. So that idea itself is not new whatsoever. So that, but that still leaves us with the question of where did the vibrator come from? So, one of the claims around vibrators is also that they were invented in the 1800s to, I'm going to choose my, word, choose my words carefully here because I really don't want YouTube to hide this, to manually manipulate hysterical women. Um, they would use clitoral massage to bring women to climax because the belief was that this would like reset women that you know that was what they needed and this would reset them and then as soon as they started feeling what was termed hysteria again um 
they could just come into the doctor and get another treatment. And I heard it, do what you want with it. Um, now this came from a 1998 book, and this is just a theory. It was put forward in a 1998 book by Rachel Maines entitled The Technology of Orgasm, in which she presented the theory that this is how the um, electric vibrator was invented and people accepted it as fact. Now she her, herself, she said it was just a, a hypothesis. She didn't have a ton of evidence to support this. And unfortunately people just were so wildly enthusiastic about this theory that it was accepted as fact and it latched on to our um, myths and legends surrounding the evolution of the vibrator and it became an accepted it became such an accepted fact and I put that in quotes fact that it was actually the basis of a 2011 film called Hysteria and the film hilariously covers the topic of how the vibrator was invented it really is a funny funny movie factual or not it's really funny. So what are the facts? Well, it is true that in 1883, Joseph Mortimer Granville invented the first electric vibrator. Now, this was not the first vibrator on the market, not at all. Um, it was there around the same time as Dr. George Taylor's, and this thing is terrifying, and I'm gonna put a picture up of it, steam-powered table massager called the manipulator. Now this was already in use in France and in the United States so the concept was not new as far as the vibrator itself. Now there is as I said there is almost no evidence that doctors um, you know provide a clitoral massage to their patients and if they did do it it wasn't done as as a regular part of their practice. This was, I would imagine it was used in extreme cases where it was just determined, you know what, this woman is most decidedly uh, three fries short of a Happy Meal and we need to do something about this. Hey, I know, let me massage her. But I don't think, um, and the evidence doesn't show, that this was a thing done on a regular basis. So, where did the, you know, why were doctors using these? Well, Granville's vibrator was designed to treat pain, irritability, digestion, constipation in men. That's right. The tool that is most commonly used by women for pleasure actually started as a tool designed for the treatment of medical conditions in men. Um, now he wasn't oblivious to the fact that it could have a sexual purpose. In fact, he used it to treat um, male sexual dysfunction, but he never used it on any women, at least not at the doctor's office, am I right? Um, now around the same time, there was a hand crank model of the vibrator by Dr. Makara, I believe it was called, called the Pulsicon. And the reason people enjoyed this model was because it was much more affordable than an electric version. And because it didn't require a power source, um, you could take it with you anywhere. And you didn't have to look for steam or electricity to hook it up to. You could just, you know, relieve your pain anywhere you had the privacy to do so. Marvelous. Now in the 19, so this is the late 1800s. In the 1900s, um, as, their, as their popularity continued to grow, um, magazines started advertising them essentially as cure-alls. They were told to be able to relieve pain, they could relieve constipation, they could relieve, um, you know, headaches, they could relieve menstrual cramps, you know, and it was just like, there are so many ads everywhere claiming what these um, 
magical little devices could do. Now I printed off a couple that I believe are from that era. And this is what they read as, and you can take from this what you will. Vibratory massage for every member of the family without trouble, expense, or inconvenience is now easily accomplished by the use of the American Portable Vibrator, which is so lightweight, weighing a mere two and a half pounds, that it can be safely and effectively used by every member of the family by attaching it to any incandescent electric light socket. It is ready for instant use. That's wild to me. Could you imagine <laughs> like plugging your stuff into light sockets? But I know that was a common thing back then. Um, before outlets were a thing, people would just use light sockets. I, I know that. Um, okay, so it says the American vibrator possessing the true rotary movement used intelligently is recommended to beautify the complexion, remove wrinkles, develop and strengthen the tissues, and by naturally stimulating the circulation, invigorate, er, invigorate, invigorate, invigorate the system, quicken the pulse, <laughs> tone the muscles, stimulate the brain, and bring about the delightful sensation of renewed energy that is necessary for an active, useful, happy family. For perfect circulation is perfect health. Mm -hmm. Now this is interesting to me. You do not have to pay us one cent for the vibrator until you have had a 15 days trial of it. That's all I want to say about that. Just Okay. I'm just going to read part of this one because this is a much longer ad, but this cracked me up. So this is for the new life vibrator. You get the proof in 10 minutes use. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so it talks, this ad again, talks about strength and vigor. It talks about, the. It, this one claims to be able to cure, to cure rheumatism, indigestion, headache, deafness. I guess that certain vocalizations might be very loud, so you'll find out, hey, I'm not as deaf as I thought I was. Um, yeah, this is just wild. So this is how they were advertising them back in the day because um, even back then, the other uses for the vibrator were frowned upon. Now, in 1915, however, the American Medical Association, seeing all these claims being made about the usefulness of vibrators. They were like, hold on. You can't just say it's going to cure everything because it doesn't. And they um, said that the, vib the vibrator industry is, quote, a delusion and a snare. So what were vibrator manufacturers supposed to do? They had a wildly popular product, but they could no longer advertise it the way they had been. So they switched their tactic. Instead of talking about the um, many, many health benefits of the vibrator, they began talking about it as a beauty aid. And they also marketed it as a home appliance for women and men and women of all ages. Now it's wild to think about, but it's true that back during this time, the vibrator was just, it was seen as a home appliance. It wasn't seen as something that was exclusively for um, pleasure. It wasn't seen as something that you had to hide away in your nightstand, none of that. It was seen as um, just another appliance to have around the house. It was a beauty aid. It was, you know, claimed to be a weight loss aid and so forth. So devices were sold in department stores and mail order catalogs and Good Housekeeping even published a review of nine different models of the vibrator. Now, manufacturers were not ignorant to the fact that there were other uses for this tool that they were selling. Um, but they couldn't write about it. They couldn't come out and just say, hey, this will give you a lot of 
pleasure in the nether regions, so you should definitely use it for that. They weren't allowed to say that. In fact, interestingly, in many cases, they're still not allowed to say that. So, it, but, it, you know, there was kind of a wink and a nod in the, some of their advertising. People knew the other uses for the vibrator, and ads would read something like this. This is for the 1908, I think it's pronounced Bebout Vibrator. It's invented by a woman who knows a woman's needs. So it's, you know, back then, and unfortunately in some degree still today, self-pleasure was seen as um, shameful. And talking about it in any capacity was seen as obscene. So there could be no advertising that was directly saying, hey, this is for your self-pleasure. They couldn't say that. So the, the aversion to the use of, uh, advertising the use of the vibrator as anything other than, like uh, at this point, a, a medicinal tool or a beauty aid um, was so frowned upon. So the 1873 Comstock Act it meant that vibrators could not be, you know, could not be advertised for their sexual uses. Um, and as I said, though, vi uh, manufacturers were not oblivious to the, the other uses of their product. And some of the devices actually came with, um, how should I put this, with, with uh, penis-like attachments that could be applied to the vibrator but in the ad these were meant to treat uterine complaints and constipation and the ads were also saying that um, vibrators could be used to treat impotence so manufacturers used a lot of double entendre I get not maybe not even that but they, it, it was very widely known that there were indeed other uses for the vibrator and this was even back in the 1800s when they were you know first gaining popularity now that does not mean that because people were aware of the other uses that they necessarily approved so as the vibrator became more popular and the alternate uses for the vibrator became more commonly known Doctors felt the need to issue a warning uh, against using them for self-pleasure. A 1912 men's advice book warned, Various electric vibrators have been abused by the unscrupulous to give men the vibratory massage of the gen generative organs, a sensation similar to, similar to that of masturbation. So contrary to popular belief, Victorian era doctors did indeed know what the female orgasm was and understood what clitoral massage would do. <clears throat> now, what did they do with that knowledge? Well, let me tell you. Some doctors believed that removing the clitoris would cure a woman of nymphomania. So it isn't as if <clears throat> they didn't know. They knew, and they used that knowledge to harm people. Now, there was only one doctor who talked to women about their experiences, confirming that they did, in fact, engage in self-pleasure and possibly used vibrators, and that was Dr. Cl Clelia Mosher. Sounds like a woman talking to women about women things, which is awesome. Now, Dr. Edwin Hirsch was concerned about the use of vibrators by women, saying, ostensibly, the treatment is for the erosion of the cervix, but the hidden purpose in innumerable cases is for the masturbatory action and the resulting voluptuous sensations. Voluptuous sensations. Voluptuous sensations. So just because it was commonly known that this is what it could be used for, it did not mean that it was an accepted use by anyone. Um, and it didn't mean that people who engaged in it weren't going to be given some side eye and 
told that they were filthy and rotten and probably had a mental illness and should probably uh, get their clitoris removed or I don't know what they did for men. Didn't graham crackers come into play somewhere in there? That would be an interesting topic to discuss. The use of graham crackers to cure the urge to masturbate. But that, my friends, is a whole other video. So, in 1954, Alfred Kinsey published research on female sexuality. And this was indeed revolutionary. Nobody had ever thought to consider female sexuality, at least not in a, in a positive way. And certainly no one had done a study on female sexuality. So here comes Alfred Kinsey with his study. And he says, his study shows that 62% of women surveyed had engaged in self-pleasure. Now around the same time, the FDA being the wonderful governmental body that it is, it started cracking down on vibrators being advertised as cure-alls. And this was like, so previously it had been the American Medical Association. Now the FDA is getting on it, getting in on it and, and telling, ad, telling manufacturers and advertisers, look, you cannot, again, we're going to tell you, you cannot advertise these things as cure-alls because they're not. They don't cure any of the conditions you're mentioning. They don't cure impotence. They don't cure deafness. They don't cure because curing something means it's gone entirely forever and always, right? They don't cure uterine cramps. And it, they said that the benefits of vibration are limited to temporary relief of minor physical conditions. So again, we had an increase in marketing vibrators as beauty aids. And in the 1950s, this just kind of went wild. So ads for the Arnold vibrator promised every woman can have a faultless complexion and youthful, finely proportioned figure. There is no further need for powder, paints, pads, or other deceptions. In 1956, Sears produced their own vibrator advertised as giving the user that great to be alive feeling. I will leave it to you to figure out what they meant by that, but I think we all know. So, Vibrators were advertised as everything from medical cure-alls to beauty tools. Hurrah, hurrah for the vibrator, right? Well, as attitudes, so then we're going to move into the 1960s to the 1970s, and as attitudes about sex and self-pleasure and um, premarital sex began to relax, people started talking more openly about self-pleasure. In fact, in the 1960s, sex educator Betty Dodson began a, a women-only workshop in New York City about self-pleasure, about masturbation. And I guess I, I didn't read up on what exactly the workshops entailed, but you can imagine that this is a demographic that had been told all along that their sexuality was an afterthought, if anything. The, you know, they had been treated like the only reason any, anyone of a professional status would be interested in their sexuality would be to um, call it deviant because a woman who enjoyed sex was considered someone who uh, had a mental illness that needed to be cured, not somebody who was living a full and healthy life and just, um, you know, enjoyed the pleasures thereof. So for her, for there to be a workshop for women teaching them about self-pleasure and that this didn't even happen until the 1960s, that's kind of wild to me, but, you know, that's what happened. And what she did was she would teach them about aids that they could use to um, 
you know, enhance their pleasure and to discover, really to discover their own sexuality. Because again, a lot of women had been denied that because they were treated as if their sexuality was something deviant, not something that should be embraced and celebrated and explored. So originally she um, recommended a couple different vibrators. One was the Ulster, I believe it's called the Stimulax. And the other was the Panasonic Pan Braider. Now, in the mid-1970s, she began recommending <clears throat> the one that we all know and love, the Hitachi Magic Wand. And that, by doing this, she helped make it one of the most popular, most widely used vibrators in all of history, which is wild. So in 1974, now her love for vibrators did not wane whatsoever as we moved from the 1960s into the 1970s. In 1974, in an article she wrote for Ms. Magazine, um, she suggested that women masturbate as a means to gain self-knowledge that society had denied them, and her recommendation was that they do it with a vibrator. And she said, quote, I have found the vibrator gives the strongest and most consistent form of stimulation and is especially good for women who have never experienced orgasm. So in the 1980s, yeah, I kind of skipped a, a, a card there. This is why I write stuff out because... I absolutely will forget things. So in the 1980s, you know, we are at a point where people are talking about these things openly. There are products out there that even though they might not be able to outright say this is uh, good for sexual purposes, people know it's not as if it's news, you know, it's not as if people don't understand what's going on. In 1983, Vibratex became the first company to develop a vibrator with internal and external components. And I think you can probably figure out what that means. And if you cannot, I suggest you look at a picture of the female anatomy. Now, these were produced in Japan and there were laws in Japan about selling sexual devices like that. So what they did was they created these tool, these aids, um, in colorful, like really brightly colored, um, you know, they were very brightly colored and they were, excuse me, they were shaped, they had cute little animal shapes on them. Like for the external stimulation, it was made in the shape of a cute little animal. Now there were several different kinds. There was, um, I think they had a turtle, they had a beaver. Um, I think I read that there was a giraffe. So these were made to look almost like children's toys, but they were not toys for children. And they did this to get around the laws in Japan. Now of all of the styles that they made, the one that became the most popular was the rabbit. And part of the reason for that is a 1998 episode of Sex in, Sex in the City in which the character Charlotte becomes actively addicted to using hers. So even though they couldn't advertise these things as such, it was not a secret what the intention of these products was. Um, even today, sometimes you'll, you know, if you were to go on Amazon and just look up vibrators. And I'm not saying I've done that. Um, you might see it, things come up as personal massager or something along those lines. It's still very much not stated plainly in all advertising that we know what you're gonna use this for. So let's just be very blunt about this. Um, I am going to pause and finish my makeup and then when I come back, we're gonna bring it up to the present and talk about where we are in the whole conversation about pleasure and tools that are used to help enhance that. I'll be right back. 
I am back. So I tried something different with my lips. It doesn't look really great on camera, but in person, oh, it looks awesome. Um, you know, I'm almost 46 years old and like every quote rule book out there says I shouldn't be wearing these bright colors at almost 46 years old. But I think the people who say that must have mistaken me for someone who cares about their opinion. <laughs> I don't. Anyway, so back to the fun, fun, fun topic of vibrators. So we talked about how vibrators were originally designed as medical devices to treat physical ailments in men, how it was soon discovered that they had alternative uses, and that as time went on, they became a tool employed mostly by women for the purposes of pleasure. Over the years, um, there have been multiple attempts by various governing bodies to curb and you know the encouragement of these uses to um, try to minimize people using them for this purpose but that failed abysmally to say the very least so where are we with that today well today there are a lot of women-owned sex positive shops that sell toys of all varieties vibrators being among them now you can buy a vibrator at Target, you can buy one at CVS Pharmacy, they're pretty much everywhere. You can buy them online if you're too embarrassed to go into a store and pick one up along with your, you know, milk and eggs at Target. Um, you can buy them online, it's very discreet. Um, you can get ones that you can sync up with your music, you can get some that are remote controlled. I mean, there are a plethora of designs, styles, um, basic models, more high-tech models, you know, if you really need that high-tech vibrator. Uh, they've even infiltrated daytime talk shows. Um, I'm guessing this was a few years back because she hasn't been doing this in a while, but on the Oprah Winfrey show, Dr. Laura Berman recommended that mothers give their teen daughters vibrators so they can explore sexual pleasure. Um, I think that's actually really good advice because I think that especially as uh, porn becomes more available, and by the way, I think you're naive if you think your child does not access that stuff if given the opportunity. Yes, they do, and it's something you need to have a very frank discussion about with your child. You know. Um, you can't pretend it's not happening. If your child has a device that's connected to the internet and any measure of privacy, I guarantee you at some point they have or will access pornography. So it's important as parents that we have honest conversations with our kids about this and about why it really, it's not made for them. And it can actually be very damaging. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, statistically we know that a lot of teen boys have looked at this. Some look at it regularly, which is very alarming because it feeds a lot of very unhealthy ideas about sex, about sexual pleasure, about what a healthy sexual relationship looks like. And unfortunately, it creates an expectation in these, I'm saying boys, but perhaps, well, girls too, because you know, for, for the boys, it creates the expectation that what they see in these um, acted out scenes is a reflection of reality. And it doesn't matter if it's violent, coercive, dismissive of their partner's pain, whatever it might be. Um, and then for girls, it creates this idea that this is what I'm supposed to do. This is how I am supposed to act to please my partner. So it is important for girls to understand what sexual pleasure should feel like. And hopefully coupled with that is a lot of conversation about consent, about setting boundaries, um, about no does mean no and doesn't mean try harder. It means no and she has the absolute right to say no at any point and expect that that boundary will be respected. Now I'm saying boys and girls here, obviously, there are other genders to be considered and to have these conversations about. I'm just saying boys and girls because that is what most studies involve. Now, 
Um, so we've come a long way in our attitudes about these things. However, there is still a lot of double standard going on. In 2010, for example, MTV refused to air, to air an ad for Tro Trojans vibrating Triforia unless the word vibrator was removed from the ad. So they could advertise the product, but they couldn't really say what the product was or obviously what its intended uses were. However, and this is still true in 2021, there were an abundance of ads uncensored for erectile dysfunction um, treatments, pills and so forth. So, you know, even though we have come a long way in understanding sexuality and in understanding, you know, especially feminine sexuality, there is still a lot to be said regarding uh, the fact that people would still rather we just not discuss it openly. Now, in some places, it is still illegal to even, you know, sell one. In 1998, Alabama law forbade the sale of any device designed for or marketed as useful primarily for the stimulation of human genital organs. At least two women, and this is as of 2018, at least two women had been arrested for you know, having these um, products. There was a 1973 law on Texas, it was uh, on the books in Texas, and it said basically the same thing, that selling or advertising a product for the use of, uh, primarily for the use of stimulation of human genital organs was forbidden. And I remember seeing not that long ago um, that I believe, I can't remember which campus it was, but there was a campus in Texas in, in protest of their uh, open carry laws. Um, on campus, they started carrying around vibrators. And the point was, it's illegal for me to have a vibrator, but I can bring a deadly weapon on campus with no problem. I, and I, I didn't know until I started researching this that that was, you know, I didn't know what they meant by that's illegal. Because at the time I just thought, wow, that's like a ridiculous law. I didn't know the history of it at all. But, and that is still on the books. Now in 2008, there was a judge who said that the law was unconstitutional and unenforceable, but the law is still on the books. And I don't know that anyone has ever been arrested for that. Maybe they were back during that campus protest. I don't know. But um, regardless, the law is still there. Now, culturally, the use of vibrators has become an accepted norm, um, particularly among lesbian and bisexual women. Um, however, we still don't know, because no studies are really being done, about the use of these um, these aids among non-binary and other gender non-conforming people. That's just really not explored. Um, they continue to be sold as massagers and novelties. Again, it is still very taboo and in some places, as I mentioned, illegal to say that this is a vibrator that you can use for sexual pleasure. You just can't come right out and say that. You have to, you know, in many cases it has to be marketed as anything but what it actually is or it can't be sold at all. Now, female masturbation, I'm going to say feminine masturbation, um, it's still portrayed as something shameful and not only something shameful, but something to be commodified and, and fetishized if possible. Um, yet, even though there is literally billions of dollars being made on the idea of feminine masturbation, it still is something that it's considered almost subversive to talk about openly and it is still something that to many people is considered inferior to sex with a man. So even though we have come a long way, we still have a long way to go. Now the U.S. heavily regulates birth control and the sale of um, sex aids for women. Now for men, medications like Viagra, you can not only have your insurance completely cover them, but you can openly advertise them with no fear of repercussions. We all know why men are taking Viagra. It's not a secret. 
And those can be, you know, it can be talked about pretty openly. I mean, you can even, if you watch an ad for Viagra, they can even come right out and say, it's to help you achieve an erection. And if you have an erection lasting more than four hours, blah, blah, blah. So we get to that question that we ask in every one of my videos. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because I, in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, I've done no research on the subject at all. These are just, this is just based on my observations and experiences, but I believe that feminine sexuality is still largely viewed as a threat. I really truly believe with everything in me that part of the reason the powers that be fear feminine sexuality is because, and this is going to sound so petty, but I'm telling you in my observations, this is what I've seen. I really think there is the fear that if women fully understood their own sexuality and their own power in understanding their sexuality, women will become aware that they don't need men for that purpose that they're they are able to achieve pleasure on their own with with tools and devices with other women um they're able to achieve fulfillment without men being there and the truth of the matter is that's largely correct does that mean that that would be the demise of um, relationships between men and women? I don't think it does, but I think the fear that, is that it will. And guys, I got to tell you though, I have to tell you, if all you're bringing to the table, if the most important thing you think you're bringing to a relationship is your sexual prowess, I'm here to tell you that at least for me and several other women I know, give it up because people, you know, people want more than that from a relationship because again, satisfaction and fulfillment can be achieved without a partner or they can be achieved with someone who isn't going to bring the complications of a relationship and they're, you know, they are just there for, for fulfillment. There are all kinds of ways to achieve fulfillment in that regard. So if that's all you're bringing and if you think that's the most important thing you're bringing, I'm here to tell you it's not. And rather than fearing a woman discovering this about you, it would be better to invest yourself in developing yourself as a whole human being, not just what your capacity is to bring sexual pleasure. That is only one facet of who anyone is. It's not all of who you are. And I'm sorry if you were fed that lie. I'm sorry if you were made to believe that the most important contribution you can make to your relationships is to provide sexual satisfaction, uh, but it's not true. And if that's all you have to offer, it's not going to be long before your partner looks elsewhere anyway. Because most people, I'm not going to say all, because there are always exceptions, but most people want something more than that from a partner. That's just how it is. But I really think the reason many people fear women discovering that there is fulfillment available um, without a man is because they fear that once women understand this fully, that women will be less inclined to have relationships with men. I do think women are less inclined to have relationships with men, but it has nothing to do with that. It's because men in the United States, apart from the intervention of very um, good people who steer them in another direction, Men in the United States are largely taught some very toxic attitudes and those carry forward into their relationships, unfortunately. So it's got nothing to do with women discovering the vibrator. And it has everything to do with women, I think as women discover their own sexuality, they also begin to discover there are a lot of things they just don't have to put up with and they're just choosing not to anymore. I know a lot of women who are single and are happy to be single and that is why. It has nothing to do with the fact that um, they can fulfill their own needs in, in the, in, in the ways of pleasure. That's not what it is at all. So you can stop blaming vibrators for that. Uh, I really think that a fully empowered, sex positive, fulfilled woman is harder to control and that terrifies people. And I think that is why there are so many taboos and so many regulations surrounding anything, not just vibrators, but anything that has to do with helping a woman 
fully understand and embrace her sexuality and feel empowered by it. So the history of vibrators taught me a lot. I learned a lot of things I didn't know. A lot of the myths that I thought were truth were actually busted for me. And we're still left with the question of how do we go forward encouraging um, sex positive feminine empowerment, understanding that, um, you know, it is possible to find fulfillment yourself and not have to have a partner if that's not something you're ready for or something you want. You know, how do we manage that when there are so many things, so many voices calling that um, something shameful or obscene? What do we do? My suggestion, take matters into your own hands. Thank you so much for watching today. I really had fun with this topic. It was, like I said, very informative for me. Um, you know, I would love to see the shame surrounding uh, sexual pleasure in general to be, uh, I'd like to see it just fall by the wayside and done away with. You know, our sexuality is a component of who we are. Enjoying that should be something that we celebrate. And I, I honestly believe that if people could feel more open and comfortable to talk about these things and to talk about their experiences in very honest terms, that the allure of any sort of illicit sexual activity would be less appealing. Because what do people want most? They want the things that they are told are forbidden. And in the United, you know, in the U.S., thanks largely to white evangelical culture and purity culture, um, sex in general has been a source of shame for a very, very long time. And, you know, imagine a world where that's not true. It would be just honestly a better world all the way around because, um, sexual pleasure isn't just about sexual pleasure to, to try to control the most intimate aspect of who someone is, has a ripple effect that go, gets into every part of our existence. And, man, a world where that was not the true, you know, where those controls were no longer in place and were no longer something so feared. Some of the most, the brightest lights and the most free people I know are people who can talk openly about that aspect of themselves because it's not their entire identity. It's not, you know, especially growing up, and I know I said I was done, but, you know, I grew up in a church, and if you did, you know that when a pastor says, um, just give me five more minutes, they really mean a lot longer than that. And I'm, you know, we're having some church right here, so this is what we're going to do. Um, I grew up in a culture that told me that my sexuality and my ability to provide sexual pleasure to someone else, namely a man, was all of who I was. That was my entire identity. And it's interesting that... For so many people that I know who grew up in that same culture, by trying to say that this is all of who you are, this is, you know, this is the most important thing about you, and the way we want you to process that is to never talk about it, to never experience it, especially if you're a woman, and most certainly to never admit that there are certain things you might see that turn you on. We're just not going to discuss any of that. The most important thing you need to know is that your sexuality exists for someone else and that you are to maintain your, quote, purity until marriage, at which point you're supposed to become very sexually proficient and amazing, despite having had no discussion of how to do that prior to your wedding night. Good luck. It's interesting how putting such a strong emphasis on that aspect of who someone is had the exact opposite effect of what was of what they were going for and I know many 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 people who fell into unhealthy sexual habits because they were not taught that human sexuality is a normal thing um, sex is a normal and healthy thing desires are normal and they're healthy and as long as you're pursuing them in a in a in an ethical way, in a healthy way, in a way that's not bringing harm to other people um, or to yourself, there's nothing to be ashamed of. So I really think that if we could speak openly and without shame about these things, the draw of, um, you know, pornography and 
um, dangerous sexual practices would have far less appeal than they do now. So by, by making these things taboo, they're actually, you know, the people that do that are actually making them far more powerful than they would be otherwise. Okay, now for real, I'm done. Thanks for being here today. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, leave a comment, share the video, subscribe. That would just be awesome. I appreciate you all so, so much, more than you can possibly know. I probably won't be doing a video for a couple weeks because we've got family visiting and it's just hard to get time in to do a video. Um, but when I come back, I, I promise you it will be with another very interesting subject that will probably uh, educate all of us because I always learn new things as I'm doing my research. So anyway, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for being awesome. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be good to yourself. Be careful out there. Um, don't shit on yourself or anyone else. And I will see you again next time. Come again. Bye.